What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and today I'm being joined by, well, I'll say two action stars of prestige, better than Stallone, bigger than Arnold. I'm being joined by Dave Horrocks and Max Byrne. How are you guys doing? You okay? Awesome, mate. Can't wait to get going on this one. Yeah, fantastic, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's a real thrill to be on the air again and talk about something I love so much. Yeah, great. No, 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 yeah, you, you're going to be bringing the canon love, mate. You're bringing the canon knowledge here. here <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be talking about action movies, but not just the whole gamut. I'm going to be bringing this down. We're talking about 80s action movies, the decade that birthed the action movie in many respects. And that's really the two things. We're just going to be a round table. There's not, we're not going on you know, a mad uh, thing about any specific film. There's two simple questions. Why did the action, uh, action movies birth in the 80s? And also, is the 80s action movie the best of the decades? Is the 80s the best action decade? So we're going to start with that, really. And I think we'll start with that question. And I'm going to put it out, and I'm going to put it out to Max first. Max, is the 80s the best action decade for you? What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Without question, it is. It's, um, I know that you know when you look back, it, I think it, you can look back it through the prism of nostalgia and things like that. And sure, you know, budgets get bigger and CGI means the spectacle of an action film now is unparalleled and, you know, fight choreography is more sophisticated now and all the rest of it. But you cannot be 80s action. It's larger than life. It's, it's, it's bigger than life. The, the stars weren't everyman characters. They were characters we aspired to be, but really never could be. They were on like, this <laughs> myth, sort of mythical pedestal. And, and yeah, there's no question, in, 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 at least, you know, it's all opinion, but my opinion is that the 80s is and always will be the golden era for action films. No question. I like that phrase, the golden era, the golden age of action movies. I, I do think that's something we'll come back to. But Dave, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Sort of like, is it the best action decade? Well, the first thing is, I wish you'd have asked me to go first and I didn't have to follow Max. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a lyrical master with these things. I, I'd have to echo a lot of the things that Max said there. I think if you look at the these macro uh, t- periods in time, so, you know, look at the 70s, look at the 80s, look at the 90s, the 2000s, within the 80s, I think we just got those larger-than-life characters we got these bombastic storylines from, you know, and, and the early 80s were quite different to the late 80s. But I, I think there's a running theme there that w- with the 70s, you got these quite gritty uh, storylines, you know, the Dirty Harrys, the Death Wishes, stuff like that. But they they were basically angry anti-heroes but normal looking blokes mm-hmm. whereas you know first blood in 82 you got stallone you know and, and that birthed the rambo series also 82 you got conan you got the human special effect that was arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> and it just seemed that through the 80s you just got these ridiculous storylines you had these massive explosions car chases everything and i'm sure what we'll speak about as well is the different genres within the action genre as well because it's not just one thing but yeah i I definitely agree with max it is a golden era for action movies because although the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s they've all had great action Mm. but Nothing is quite like going back and watching something like Commando, watching something like John Matrix tell his fellow military guy that, you know, just smell the guys because they might be coming from downwind. (laughs) (laughs) What the fuck are you talking about? But it just it just makes sense in this nonsense eighties action world that we've got. Commando's a really interesting point because I think 
in my head, like you mentioned, like Rambo as being a sort of um, you know a staple. We've got Stallone bringing that, um, and that that's an interesting one. We'll get to Rambo and how he changed, but Commando is almost like light in a bottle, isn't it? It's almost like they went, here's what the action genre is, and then that's it from then on. Like Arnie and you know, I mean, it was written by um, Jeff Loeb, is it? Um, I believe. Um, was it Silverman? Oh. Yeah, um, I'm going to double check. No, I've got a feeling it was written by Jeff Lowe. But um, yeah, it's one of those films that sort of like, they, they just seem to have like hit that thing. They were like, yeah, here's the, as, you know, as you said, Max, that this mythical hero, this retired colonel who like, how he's retired at that age, I don't know. How he's in such incredible shape, don't know. No, uh, but there's so this, much like, this American like, hero. That is he's speaking all... with this weird accent. <laughs> I love the fact that like, he's got this all-American daughter, like, and he's then got this really thick Austrian accent. Where's the mother? Never explained. Doesn't matter. It's inconsequential <laughs> to the film. And that's what it's just so like. It's, it's to the bone, isn't it? That film. It's just sort of like, right. Here's the superhero. Here's the here's the MacGuffin of, of saving his daughter. Here's the clock. Go. Yeah. And it's just perfectly um put together and it's sort of ever since then i feel like everybody's been trying to sort of chase the dragon really of commando which is like you know the only flaw of commando is um is the villain the sort of the the, the bennett of the situation <laughs> freddie mercury <laughs> fat freddie mercury um, stick around yeah <laughs> There you go. No story. But there you go. Yeah, you're right. Uh, story by Jeff Lowe, written by Stephen D'Souza. And Stephen D'Souza is a massive. Like, he wrote loads of the the, the, the action movies now. But um, he's Die he Hard. Die he? Hard. For, but I was, he's, he wrote the other one I was going to mention as well, uh, which comes in as a sort of a precursor. So, you said eighty two. Mm. Eighty two is Rambo. Mm. Well, first, first blood. Sorry, it's Conan. First blood. Yeah. It, it's also uh, forty eight hours. Um, nice. Which is that sort of the birth of sort of the buddy, the buddy, buddy cop genre? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eighty two is a bit of a watershed year, really, isn't it? it does seem to be, doesn't it? Mm. Um, but yeah, command. Let's just focus in on Commando as a starting point. Let's just look at Arnie for a start. And then, so Commando. What are your thoughts? And I've just said that, that to me, it's like the quintessential ridiculous um, action movie. Um, but I'll, I'll go to again. I'll go to, I'll go to Max first. What, what are your thoughts on Commando? Commando is a nigh-on perfect 80s action film. Yeah. It just has all the ingredients that you want to see in an 80s action film. A hero that is borderline indestructible, taking on unsurmountable odds. Like that last, you know, last section where he must kill 100 men all by himself. <laughs> Not, does, they barely get a shot on him, you know. It just <laughs> everything, the, 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 the one-liners, the little bits of comedy here and there, you know. Despite the stakes being so high, there's still time to dispatch a baddie, but give him a pithy one-liner as you, you know, drop Sully by his leg off the cliff. Ooh la la! <laughs> yeah, and he says ooh la la as he goes off the cliff. What the <laughs> but yeah, well, it's, it's just perfect. It, you know, you can look at it through a you know a modern day audience's viewpoint and think oh it's a bit it's a bit unsophisticated the the story is pretty paper thin you know we don't know much about where the characters have been prior to us meeting them but who cares you don't need to anything no. you've got is in that it's, it's a taut ninety minute film it never stops from work from word go to end credits it just goes and goes and goes like you said the villain's a bit weak <laughs> but other yeah. than that it is spot on it's it's prime era arnold schwarzenegger for me it, to me it's what makes him everyone talks about terminator and, and and that but to me commando is like the arnie movie like that's like you know yeah he had conan and you know yes that's great and then he had um you know terminator and, and, and conan the destroyer in 84 but to me, it's like the, his pinnacle is Commando because that's the sort of thing that after that, that's when it's sort of you get that. <laughs> like, there's a there's, there's a there's a relationship between John Matrix and Dutch <laughs> Shaper. Oh, he's, he's almost the same character. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Dave, what are your thoughts on then Commando um, and the Schwarzenegger sort of uh, Adonis? I I just love it. I, and I remember, you know, I, w one of the things I, I do really miss, and and 
I know we'll never get back these days because even if you created a video shop, you know, and, and tried to create a shop which just had that feel, even if people didn't rent videos from there, people couldn't be asked to go there because they can just mm. scroll on Netflix. So so it, it will never come back. But I do really long for those days when you could just go and you would see the same video covers and you just can't help but see in my mind's eye now that that VHS cover shot where you've just got the big muscles holding the big massive gun, yeah. you know, and pointing out of the VHS cover and it just looks amazing. And I think the the story there's no real build up. This is not a Zack Snyder movie. It doesn't take three hours to get going. It is straight <laughs> in there. You know, it, it, it's like you get a, li- a few nice moments with the daughter, and then that's it. She's kidnapped, and and he's on a quest. Then, mm-hmm. and you just get uh, you know all the these uh, these littered bodies all over the place. <laughs> these one liners, you know. Um, what is it? Uh, this green beret is going to kick your ass. Yeah, I eat green berries for breakfast. I'm right now. I'm very hungry. Yeah. <laughs> just fucking relentless, and I love it. I can go back and watch Commando. And it just feels like I'm watching it for half an hour. It, it mm-hmm. just goes at such a pace. And it is just, it balances almost, I would say, almost creates the template for the MCU because it's dealing with something that is very serious, very traumatic. You know, you're talking about a dad, single dad who's had his daughter stolen, you know, so it could be a, a really emotionally weighty story. You've got loads of action in there and you're balancing some comedy in there as well. Yeah. So I, I just think it is as close as you can get to a perfect action movie as you're going to get. I think you're right, and I think, like you said, from the bat, like that's it. Like, you know, off, off they go. Because you're right, and you, you've hit a point I wanted to sort of put, uh, touch on later on. Because there's a difference between Stallone and and Schwarzenegger in many, many ways. But one of the things I find is like, you know, Stallone has done a whole heap of stuff, and I really like Stallone. Um, but he always seems to take himself very seriously. And in the Rocky films, fine, I've got no problem with that. You know, like I can watch, I can watch Rocky Four all day, every day, and be completely happy with that. But there's still a point where you go, oh, Stallone thought this was a proper drama. Like he, you know, he knew what he was making. But, but in the same way, when you watch the Rambo films, you go like, I don't know. He thinks he knows, you know, he knows they're an action film, but he thinks he's making a statement about, you know, um, the war in Afghanistan, or, or um, yeah. <laughs> We'll get to Rocky. We'll get to Rambo three in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things I find with Arnie is that like he hit again. This is why I think Commando is so important because he hit that that niche of like, oh yeah, I do the one liners. Like I'm the comedy, not the comedy one, but like the tongue in cheek. Mm. You know, because if you watch like, all the other from that point on, they introduce that even in like uh, Predator. Like you know, mm. they do they do the um, they invade the drug camp, you know the sort of the the rebel camp, whatever it is, the guerrilla camp, mm-hmm. and he he kicks a door and at one point and he's like you know he throws knock, a knife, knock. And he, yeah, knock, knock. <laughs> and then he throws a knife through someone, and he's like stick around, yeah, <laughs> and you're like the one liners and you know, running man and um, I literally I was literally just sort of like flicking through some films to sort of watch before we started this, and I watched a little bit of Red Heat. Um, with him and, and John Belushi, I was like, and the the opening of that film is incredible because it starts in like a Russian bath, and it's like Arnie just like running around in a, a tiny flannel, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. fighting. But he, you can see there's like a twinkle in his eye that he's like, oh no no, you you know like he, he comes in looking all hard, like you know butchers anything. I don't say hard, and he's in the bath, but he looks he looks as butchers anything, like he's ripped. And then you just see his ass, and you're just like, "Oh, he knows this is funny. Like he knows what's yeah. what's being done." Um, and and uh, yes, yeah, so it's it's that thing of that balance of comedy, which I think has influenced so many films and so much sort of action films in the, the after. Um, I don't know, but yeah, that balance of comedy and action. Do do action films need tension relief? A bit of comedy to sort of break the tension. Max, what do you think? Yeah, sometimes I think they do. Yeah, because sometimes you know, especially back then when it was all about the body count and it was all about the OTT deaths and things like that, you know, just to stop it from going too far in a dark direction, just bring it back with a little one-liner, a little quip, something like that. Um, 
I think it, I think, and I think no one to this day has done that better than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm. You know, people can talk about his acting skills or lack thereof, and all the rest of it, his lack of range and versatility. Um, but no one can deliver a one-liner after dispatching someone better than Arnold Schwarzenegger for my money. Nobody has done it before. Nobody will do it better. He is he is the man as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, with Stallone, I think. <laughs> I think Stallone thinks, sees himself as more of an artist than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. I mean, Stallone's directed a lot of his own movies and, writ- and written the screenplay for a lot of his own movies. Mm-hmm. Very, very talented filmmaker, Stallone, when you look at it over the years, you look at his filmography. Mm-hmm. But I think when you look at Stallone's output through the 80s, there was certainly a lot less comedy in his films. You look at films like Cobra, <laughs> the R- Rambo, the Rocky films, yeah. Lock, Lock Up, things like that. Judge Dredd. <laughs> there the was less comic relief in those films I think he was trying to see himself as playing more of a I mean it's hard to say a realistic character because Stallone was very much like a, a cartoon character in the 80s like Arnie was you know ripped to shreds you know completely like specimen but he always seemed to be slightly more edging on the side of realistic than Arnold Schwarzenegger um, yeah. and, he, and he still believed I mean Sylvester Stallone is seventy five years old next week, but he's yeah. still con- he's still convincing now. He's still yeah. making action movies, and you don't watch it and go, "Look at this old fool here! What what a joke!" But you still buy it. You can still, yeah. you know, if he could make another Rambo film tomorrow, and I'd be there, and I wouldn't be watching it going, you know, he's an old man. I'd be watching it going, "Yeah, he's kicking some ass." He he's still believable now, even at his age. So yeah, I think you know to to go back to your question, I think comedy is is fine in action films, especially eighties action films because they were sort of played larger than life. Mm. Um, it just depends on the actor and who's delivering it. But yeah, Arnie, absolute king of of, of the comedy mixed with action, and you, always will be. Do you think? Because Stallone was ultimately, you know, he was more creative, wasn't he? He was more pushing his writing. And then, you know, the, the acting sort of came as part of the writing, whereas mm. Arnie sort of never had ambitions of, of getting involved in the writing. And so he sort of focused on the on-screen stuff. And I just think his comedy timing, I would say they're both equally as driven as each other, but they just took different approaches. I, th- I think one of the things to think about the two of them that's quite interesting. I mean, you know, they, they're, they're definitely driven. I mean, there's no way that like you, you have to be driven to have achieved what they did. Um, you know, I mean, the story of Stallone is like you know he had the script for Rocky that he wrote, and then we kept trying to give it to studios to say like you know and I I am Rocky, and everyone wanted other people to play it, and he held mm-hmm. on to it until he, they gave in, and you know, thank goodness he did because I think that sort of really started his career. And yeah, he wrote a lot of the other Rockies and directed them, and so. But I think like you're right. I think there's an element there of like Schwarzenegger was more about the presentation of the on-screen package, um, mm-hmm. uh, and that sort of was the key. You know, he was he, you know yes, Stallone was ripped, and he was, but he was it was he was. Schwarzenegger was Mister Universe. <laughs> I mean, that's the difference. Mm. Yes, Rocky is Rip, but like Arnie was, like, he was Hercules. You know what I mean? Like this dude, like he's Conan. Like this guy is, <laughs> you know, the Austrian Oak. Uh, and I think it's it, it's slightly different. Um, but the other thing as well is, I think I've, I've recently read, uh, reread actually, was Arnie's biography, uh, Total Recall. And there's a really interesting bit in that that when he was trying to break into movies you know obviously he'd done as much as he could in bodybuilding and he was already making millions off that and people kept saying to him like well you're not going to work because your vo- your accent doesn't work and you you don't you, you know you haven't got the right body and all this other stuff and he's like no no i think you'll find that my you know, oh, his name was too long and no one will remember it and then they're like he was like no, no that's my hook that's mm. my package and that's what people and it was actually um the guy who I can't have to check now, but the guy who um, uh, directed Conan, I know from his name, um, John Milius. Yes, it was. He's the guy that really wanted to bring him in, um, and it was he had to convince Dino De Laurentiis. Yeah, John Milius, and John Milius literally had to take him in and convince Dino De Laurentiis that this guy could do it, and he didn't believe him. And then he started to see the dailies, and like then he was like, "Oh no, no, like this guy." can can you know can do it like he is like the perfect package for this stuff so it didn't happen overnight but um 
they they happen because they really were driven to do those things. So you know, yeah. um, can I just throw out there because you mentioned about 1982 and we've kind of stumbled across this, but I just want hmm. to throw these these movies at you. So 1982, First Blood, Conan mm-hmm. the Barbarian, 48 Hours, Tron, <laughs> Blade Runner, Star Trek. The Wrath of mm. Khan, E.T., Beastmaster. Is this one of the greatest years that there has ever been for great movies? Right. Uh, uh, we, this is a sidetrack. We'll go on. We will go down this little rabbit hole for a moment, right? Because I tried to look at this today because people say things like, oh, this is the best year in cinema. And people will quote like 1994 or like 1999 gets quoted a lot and this other stuff. But then when you look at the 80s, like you say, you can say 82. 84 is another one. 84, like 84, yeah. 84 has yeah. got loads in it. Yeah, Ghostbusters, the first Nightmare on Elm Street film. Um, Gremlins. Um, yeah, loads. Like 84 is Supergirl. Supergirl. <laughs> <laughs> for some. For some, maybe. But then like you get 89. It's like the biggest year for sequels. Like you get Back to the Future Part 2, uh, Ra- uh, Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2, Lethal Weapon 3, I think. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's weird how sort of like, yeah, some films, some years are just incredible when you look at them and you're just like, wow, like we were spoiled that, that year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think you're right. But it sounds to me like 82 is quite an important year for, mm. um, for, for, for action in particular. So we've talked about Arnie and um, we will come back to Arnie because obviously I want to talk about Predator and Terminator and stuff like that. But Let's let's flip to the other guy then. Let's flip to Stallone and let's talk Rambo for a moment. Um, what are your thoughts on Rambo? Because again, like, you know, Max, you just said then about you, you know, I'm assuming you've seen Last Blood. Yeah. Oh yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Max, um, Dave, have you seen it? Have you seen Last Blood? Yeah. 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 So so Stallone as as, a, as an action star then, that, that, and Rambo in particular. What are your thoughts on Rambo? I and mean, Dave, we'll go to you first. Actually, this. What what are your thoughts on Rambo as a developing character? So my family were were big Stallone fans. So from from me being or, or from me being able to form memories, <laughs> that's as long as I can remember Stallone being on on screen. So. You know, Rocky was always playing. I had uncles who were, were into the amateur boxing scene, so Rocky was always being played there. Mm. And I remember seeing First Blood at, at a very early age when, you know, kids nowadays will be watching In the Night Garden or uh, <laughs> Mr. Tumble or something. I was watching First Blood. So, <laughs> you know, he's it, just always been there for me. And I, I just, I, I've gone back to those movies recently and it amazes me how great his acting is, mm. you know, especially in First Blood, mm-hmm. you know, and especially in that final scene where he's pouring his heart out. I just think that for me, those are Oscar winning scenes. And there is a little bit of snobbery, isn't there, with the Oscars and, and what genres they recognize and what genres they don't recognize. But for me, his acting there just holds up against anyone. But then you sort of look at other stuff that Stallone has done, and I don't know what it is, but he seems wildly inconsistent because sometimes his acting's atrocious. And you're thinking, I don't get how this is the same guy. And again, I can only rationalize it myself by thinking, well, maybe he's taking his eye off the ball. Maybe he's focusing on the writing. He's thinking about what other characters will do rather than just focusing on his own game. and uh, I, But I've got such... In my lifetime, I don't think there's many greater kind of characters, you know, and, and influences than Stallone and Arnie. Mm. You know, and, and just such a huge amount of respect for both of them. Yeah. But Max, what about your thoughts on Rambo then? So we'll, we'll... It's such a kind of a weird film series Rambo because like Dave said the acting in, in the first one in um, First Blood yeah well you may want to get it you may want to get it closer to the mic yeah um, have you got your thumb or, or anything over the mic Max yeah mm, don't think so right it's better now all oh, right okay sorry um yeah so the Rambo series is a really odd kind of series because like Dave said before the acting in 
first blood is superb and it's this quite intimate film about you know a vietnam vet struggling to find his way in in a a country that's rejected him and you know via sort of happenstance finds himself in this you know bad situation in this small town um and it's quite a small film small scale film really but then when you move to parts two and specifically part three it stops rambo stops becoming that character and almost becomes this generic 80s action movie killing machine you know he's there spends half the film with his top off which you know if i had a physique like that i'd never have a top on um and just goes around killing you know vietnamese in the second film and, and and russians in afghanistan in the in the third film and it becomes less about a performance from stallone like it is in the first film and then in two and three it becomes just um, him as muscle bound one man army, and mm. and that kind of depth of the first one's kind of lost. I did think when he resurrected it and brought it back in Rambo Four, and then again in um, Last Blood, it he kind of went full circle and back, went back to more of a character based uh, portrayal as a, as an older man and and you know a bit more depth to it. Um, so it's such an up and down series. I absolutely adore first blood and i love rambo four or rambo whatever it's called mm. and i really like last blood but two and three for me the great fun and the great spectacle but they just they seem very much sort of 80s action by the numbers if that makes sense i don't know what you guys think but that's the way i've always looked at the rambo series yeah you you're right with well, the, the weird thing with that i've always had an issue with rambo and i love the whole franchise i will say like i can watch all of them and i'll take them all on um their own merit in many ways you know even the ones that are basically sort of like the third one that's sort of like this is dedicated to, to the mihaj was it the mihaj dean or whatever it is <laughs> well yeah basically you're supporting this film's dedicated bin to uh, to bin laden <laughs> before yeah so different times um, Tight yet yeah, different times, you know, friends and friends become foes and foes become friends. Um but one of the things I find it most interesting about Rambo as a character is like I say he starts out as this sort of like not not anti government, but like you say, he he represents a, a proportion of the you know, the those people that came home from the Vietnam War and were you know, rejected, like you say, matched by society. And the the opening scene of that film when he turns up at that house and he's looking for his um one of his, you know, his, his bat, one of his squad it's mates or whatever. And the woman says, like, we, you know, he's not here. He, he died of cancer. Um, you know, he was what taken was it, by... The orange... Agent, Agent Orange. orange. Agent yeah. Orange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he died of cancer and stuff. And, and, and Stallone's, you say, his acting at that point, is like, it's heartbreaking because he's sort of lost. He's like, well, this was... This is what I'm here for. This is who, you know, I'm trying to find... I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be found and I can't do it. Um, and then obviously the film progresses from there, and so it feels like it's, it's more of a sort of an action drama because it's driven by Teague, the the sheriff, as he sort of like you know tries to drive him out of town and all this other stuff. And it's it's excellent, and it, you know the, the fact about Rambo is the the thing to note again, like you know you say Max is he doesn't actually kill anyone for the most part in that film. Yeah. He he wounds them, but he makes a point of like. Uh, not killing them because I love it when he does corner them and he says I could have killed any one of you at any point. Um, There's the one guy, isn't there, from the helicopter that that throws the stone and and he falls and he is a douchebag yeah. who deserved to die, but that is the one guy. In the book, he, he does kill a lot more, he but does. again, it's Stallone's influence. He was the one who wanted to make sure he didn't kill you know anyone and and. There's so much action going on. You almost need reminding of that. But again, for Mm. me, a genius move on his part. You know, it makes him such an empathetic character. And actually, I don't want to take us off down a rabbit hole, but I think movies like First Blood did a massive amount to change America's perspective on their military. Mm. Because at that time... They were like, you know, the ginger headed stepchild. They they didn't look after their military at that time. This isn't a rabbit hole because this is exactly where I was going to go. All right. That, fair enough. <laughs> that there's, no, but you, cause you are right. You are spot on. The, the, the difference between um, Rambo and Rambo, you know, First Blood and then First Blood Part Two, is Ronald Reagan. Mm. Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1981 and. Um, was all about the military. He was, you know, he was Republican. He was, you know, he was all, he was all about rebuilding the military. Sounds familiar, but rebuilding the military and all this other shit. Make America great um, again. Exactly. <laughs> um, 
and one of the things to note is the the permit just just the amount of military based characters that are then used throughout the 80s as heroes you know and, and rambo is one where he almost becomes a personification of america abroad um and one of the funny things is the CIA becomes the enemy in a lot of these films. Like, so in Rambo, in, in First Blood Part 2, it's the CIA that, like, oh, no, you're just going in as, um, what is it, just going in as reconnaissance. You know, we just yeah. want you to go look. Don't do not do anything. Don't engage. Just go and look. And he obviously yeah. does engage. Um, but he's, he becomes sort of like the conscience of America. That's what Rambo becomes to represent. And the same in 2. Uh, sorry, the same in 3. Like, you know, yeah, we can't really intervene. In, in in Afghanistan, because you know the Russians are there, and it makes a cold war a hot war. Um, but we can send we can send John Rambo in, and he becomes the conscience of America of defending those people that we can't really defend. Yeah. And so you know, because even was it um, Ronald Reagan actually said if if Ram, uh, John Rambo would vote Republican. Uh, he said, I remember saying that in a speech. And so, you know, there is this notion, and it's the same with like John Matrix and, and this re- this representation of the American military as this muscle bound thing. Again, you look at Predator, um, and in that, like all the guys in it, yeah, they're mercenaries sort of thing. So slightly different. Or they're American, spe- they're a special, but they're a special forces unit. I'm never mm-hmm. entirely sure if they're supposed to be mer- mercenaries or not. But Carl Weathers, who's the one who sort of like betrays him a little bit because he really wants to take on the CIA. Yeah, you know, yeah. 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 Um, so there's a definite. You you are totally right about um, the po- the position of the military from eighty to eighty nine completely mm-hmm. changes. Um, you know, and that, and that, I'm trying to think of other examples, but yeah, the, the, it's a real. Oh, in fact, actually, Max, we'll go to 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 Canon. You know, think um, missing in action. Surely that's missing going in action. Up. Yeah, missing <laughs> in action. Or um, what's the other one that he did? Delta um, Force. Delta Force, mm. uh, you know, Invasion USA, yeah, uh, you know, all those. Um, Invasion USA is an interesting one because that, that comes to me of this same thing of like Invasion USA, um, Red Dawn, um, Toy Soldiers. This this thing of like you know the communists invading invading America, and then you know true Americans fighting back, um, and Chuck Chuck Norris basically sort of riding a bull into, you know, into, riding in like a golden eagle. A bold eagle into battle. Something like that. Oh, we, we can't miss Top Gun out of that lot, surely. Well, yeah, exactly. Another one. This, 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 this. You know, this jingoistic sort of action films of the mid '80s. But if you want to do that, 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 that's when you can group in all kinds of things. Not really action films, but Rocky Four is probably the most jingoistic Americana film ever. Beautiful. It's, it's an amazing <laughs> film. I love it. But yeah, you're right. Now, this idea of sort of. Um, the military sort of being represented in a much stronger way um, throughout the eighties. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Or am I, or am I... Isn't, it, isn't it weird though? Because I, I'm still, you know, approaching half a century and I still struggle to wrap my head around American politics. And the fact that there is such a duality about everything they do, so, mm-hmm. so you say about you know the military is put forward as this kind of uh, in the movies put forward as this powerful force you know stick your chest out we should be proud of the military and we'll just send in John Rambo or send in Chuck Norris and they'll kick the ass of anyone. But then the CIA, who are you know in real life or you know the doing America's bidding by stealth. It, 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 they're the bad guys, but it's it's so weird. Like the idea of America, the 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 real ideal. Like so, let's think Steve Rogers, Captain America, mm. is all about freedom, and it's this utopian idea, you know, uh, the land of opportunity and all of that. But then the actual reality of it is a lot more the Ronald Reagan, the dirty business that the CIA do. And and we don't like to talk about that. And you've got these two opposing forces. And it's almost as if, as a country, they can play both sides and never be wrong. And, and that's what I'm constantly trying to get my head around, is is how they can actually do that. It, it's, it's, it's the way they present themselves. Because, again, think about it. It's, it's, you, you're right. But when you think of, like, say, if you think of the British, the uh, from our point of view, our biggest action hero, our, our biggest action star, 
is James Bond. And he literally represents our Secret or, Service. So, or Sherlock Holmes, I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if you think it's James Bond... It's not the same as Arnie, is it? <laughs> no, we, we, we never quite got there on the on that front. Um, but, like, you know, yeah, we, we, we fully support like, this idea of the Secret Service. We, we were like, oh, no, it's, 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 our boy is doing well, you know, fighting mm. the good fight. Um, and and we, we've always had that mentality. But, um, yeah, America seems to be... like it's. Div- America it both loves itself and hates itself, doesn't it? Or it, it loves itself but doesn't trust itself. Mm. Like it, it wants to have an internal conflict, and it always has. And I think Vietnam, once you get... And I, oh, you're now going to get me on the history thing. <laughs> Post-World War II, that's when it, it sort of all started, because you get mm. the greatest generation, your Captain Americas, who mm. sort of fought Nazis, and it was nice, and it was clean, and it was easy. They're the bad guys. They do bad things, and we can, we are the ones that save the day. And you know, yeah, without America's intervention in the Second World War, it probably would have been a very different story. That's fine. I've got no problem, to, you know, agreeing to that. Post that, though, they get this awkward moment when they're like, oh, we, we did sort of fight side by side with the communists, but we don't like them now. And so they have this Cold War, and all of a sudden they have this new enemy, and then it becomes internalised, because back home, during the 50s, you have, like, McCarthyism, you know, with the Red Scare, when, you know, mm-hmm. they're shipping people that they believe are communists, and then in the 60s, you get people that are objecting to the Vietnam War, because they're now looking for their new World War II, they're looking for their new war, because you've had Korea, and you've had lots of other stuff. Yeah. And so you get a generation that, especially, and then, well, more than that, actually, following after that, you get Nixon in the 70s, where the government is clearly doing a whole bunch of shitty stuff, and the, the president mm. literally says it's not against the war if the president does it. Mm. So you get a generation yeah. that are sort of like, our boys, our boys abroad, the working class, that's the thing, they're the ones, they're representing us, but then you've got the government, in inverted commas, who they feel are all secretive, and anyone who works for the government are evil. And so you have this weird, you have this weird dichotomy of the fact that, like, well, the army, the, the army, the military is a branch of the government. Like, yeah, <laughs> it yeah. works. It's in it's weird, and and you mentioned about Korea there, and actually that's a, a an interesting subtext that as a kid when I was watching First Blood, I, I just never picked up on. But Teasel, you know, who is playing mm. by played by Brian Dennehy. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant actor and plays an absolute douchebag of a of a policeman. You know, he he talks about the Korean War. And it's almost as if, you know, my veteranism counts for more than yours. And it's It's cleaner. It's yeah. cleaner. That's the point. It's a yeah. my 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 service is cleaner than your service. My war was a good war. Yeah. Vietnam wasn't. And so there's this there's this division of if you fought in Vietnam, then you know you are you are um, uh, you know you are you are stained by that it war. It was an ugly ugly war, wasn't it? And yeah, again, it this is a massive tangent, and probably we should go on to Mike's show for this one. But you know, you look back at history, and it was all the wrong reasons to get involved yeah. with that. You know, again. Yeah. I, I look back at it now, and we grew up with this idea. We we grew up in the Cold War. Mm-hmm. And it, it's only now, uh, as I'm approaching the age that I am, I'm, and I'm thinking, well, who would have the biggest problem with a socialist ideal, with the idea that giving power to the workers, who would have the biggest problem with that? Well, it's the fucking elite, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and as we sit here in a conservative fucking government again, and I'm thinking, well, fuck me. Were we on the right side? I, I'm genuinely having that argument with myself weekly at the moment. I, I, and There's I don't representations. Know the I mean, yeah, Stalinist, Stalinist Russia is a well, slightly right, I'm different. Not, I'm concept. not behind <laughs> Stalin. Just But just as, as, a, <laughs> as an ideal. <laughs> Let's not talk about but, the practice. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right then. But, and I'll, you know, I'll bring it back to a point then to, to, to bring it around to action movies again. But you're right. But for me, I think, think conservative action movies are incredibly conservative. Now, that's, I'm not saying fascist yep. or right wing because you can make the fascist argument, and I'm sure there are people that would. But they are conservative because an action film is all about maintaining the status quo. Your hero in all the films 
is fighting against someone that threatens the status quo, usually for a bad reason. Mm-hmm. You get ones later down the line, and one day we'll do the rock. And we'll do the rock. We'll do the nineties where you get to talk about like the rock, or where you know it's less clear. Um, but in the nineties, it was like, oh, it's the drugs war, so we're going to go off and fight a drug lord. Oh, it's a communist, so we're going to go off and fight the communists, or we're going to fight you know mm-hmm. whoever. But it was all about maintaining the status quo. But the hero was also relate not relatable, I suppose, but you said aspirational, I think, as you said, Max. There was this yeah. idea of that they were aspirational. But it was incredibly conservative because America was the best, that we're the strongest, we are the world protectors, and we are maintaining the status quo. I don't know. What, what, Max, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a very common trope of 80s action, um, especially with, like, with canon films. There were so many films uh, where they just sort of, you know, take one actor out and insert another. Yeah. And so many, so many military-based films where, uh, you know, an ex-vet who's the only man for the job is, is sent off to some hot spot somewhere at the behest of the CIA. And then, <laughs> like you were saying about the CIA always being sort of portrayed as this sort of murky, sort of background, shadowy cabal. That was always prescient. They would always they would always be sent to wherever they were sent to, the back end of beyond to go and, you know, eliminate some dictator or rescue some hostages. But then they'd always end up getting big get, get screwed at the end by their CIA mm-hmm. handlers. That's such a, a massive trope. And then having defeated the the quote unquote main villain of the film, some despot somewhere, they would have to then have to come back and there'd be a reckoning with the CIA handler where they'd usually pop one in pop one in their head or something like that because they'd screwed them. And I think, yeah, certainly throughout the 80s they were projecting America, especially America America's military might mm. as um not only a, a powerful and dominant force, but a moral force as well. Yes. Every time there was a questionable act it was something that was given to them by like we say you know a shady government character or something like this you know they always say oh i'm sorry colonel i'm sorry major this one comes straight from the top this one comes straight from washington yeah yeah that's, there's so that's such a key line in all these films you know and then there'll be some it won't be a military person specifically it'll be a political person pulling the strings mm-hmm. or something like that you know someone you know a, 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 a shady cabinet minister or something like that who's got the president's ear um so it's such a, a common trope and you know i suppose it is like you said it's a, it's a time capsule of its time isn't it because mm. that was what they were trying to get you know like you said they'd gone through the shit show of the vietnam war and then this you know portraying the american military in, in not a very good light to say the least and then you know they come out of that into this this larger than life decade the 80s was all about excess and everything being big larger than life mm. just in actual films music was bigger and larger than life in those days everything was you know turned up to 11 so they wanted to you know just put it out there the, you know the american military is 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 right it's just it's you know it's fighting for the not just for america but it's fighting for the world you know we'll send you know in these films we'll send a, a crack unit to you know the far east we'll send a crack unit to send you know a central american jungle to liberate the downtrodden you know it's very mm. very common and you know like i said if it's if there's something wrong going on then there's a reason for that you know and it wasn't their wasn't their fault they were given bad intel or, or, or you know shady orders so it's very very prescient thing in, in those films but you know I, I think it works quite well overall <clears> you know despite the fact that you know you can count you can just go through the list and there's so many films where these that kind of story plays out but it it works quite well i think and as a as a some films kind of become propaganda pieces don't they in the 80s yeah. as opposed to just like we were saying before about commando and it's there's there's not really a story to tell there you know it's <laughs> like this this is the situation this is what you're going to do go and 90 minutes later we'll meet up at the end with your daughter yeah and, I think a lot of the time they were playing that game in the 80s. They weren't really telling a, a, a grounded story. They were just portraying portraying their organisations as they wanted them to be depicted, um, as they wanted them to be foreseen by the rest of the world, I think. Like, like mytholo- yeah, making themselves mythological, you know. Yeah. Uh, telling modern myths. I mean, you know, it's really, you know. Um, and again, because it always comes down to that, the one-man army as well, doesn't it? Like Commander is the perfect little one-man army. But the same with like Predator. You know, in Arnie, like it comes down to um, him, you know, that one on one, mano y mano sort of thing of taking on the predator. Um, and that's also the trope, isn't it? You know, of those sorts of things. Um, gonna, gonna, gonna sort of flip, flip the, um, 
the channel a little bit because we've been talking about the American military. We've been talking about you know, and I think it, it's as you said, it's a massive part of of, of 80s action movies and, and seeps into the 90s. I mean, you know, even like with Van Damme and sort of like AWOL and, and all the stuff that he ended up doing. But there's, there's another group that is also, um, I would say, probably not, you know, uh, not in the best light at the moment, but was massively represented in the 80s, and that's police. Um, and, you know, s- starting starting really, I suppose, with Dirty Harry in 71 and, and working through, you, you get this representation of sort of like the action police, the action cop um I mean, you know, obviously from Dirty Harry to to Lethal Weapon, um, and uh, Cobra is another, so you know, great example. So let's have a thing about action. You know, action police is a bit more is is a little less Arnie and Stallone and a bit more sort of varied. But uh, so you know, let's think about what what are your thoughts on that, sort of, um, Dave? Action police of the eighties. I think in the eighties they were great. Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> And I, I think particularly, I, I like to, you know, a little bit like Marvel, I like to center my thoughts around the uh, New York kind of region. Because yeah. you think, I, I in the late 80s, I went to New York, and it was a fucking dangerous place. Mm. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> um, you know, and you watch movies like Dirty Harry, and, and there is this kind of sense that you need to be really hard on the criminals. Mm. Um I might be getting a bit more lefty uh, as the years go by, but it's like you look back at some of these movies and you're like, well, as you just killing all these people and you haven't actually, you know, this, this guy is maybe trying to feed his family or you've no idea what his situation actually is. Mm. And, And so coming back to your point about how, kind of conservative some of these movies are i I definitely think the police are that um and something we all love is is the superhero genre and i actually i'm I'm gonna kind of look at batman a little bit um scott you you said a phrase uh i could even be a couple of years ago now where you just said batman's a guy who dresses up as a bat and goes out and be- he's a rich guy who goes out and beats up poor people. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. you know what? That actually sums him up perfectly <laughs> because with the resources that he has, he doesn't need to go and beat up low life criminals, you know, who are just trying to make a few quid to feed their family potentially. So I I don't know. I think I I look back less fondly at the kind of police action mm. genre. Things like Lethal Weapon, generally, you know, you're dealing with arms and things like that. You know, it's a bit more, if you're being shot at, of course, you know, you're within your rights to shoot back. But but some of the other things, like like Dirty Harry in particular, I don't, I don't yeah. like looking back at those, to be honest. No, yeah. Max, what are your thoughts on the 80s police action? 80s police action? I think so. Before you start, can I just say, say, eighties police action is a really good name for a band. By the way, I've just decided. Yeah. On. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry <Great> trademarked. <laughs> yeah, um, I think eighties cop films. I think just became much of a muchness. Mm. Every character seemed to be kind of the same. The the wife will have left them because of their. They were working all hours around the clock. They would have a drinking problem, no question, mm. borderline alcoholic, or if not. 100% alcoholic, maybe a substance abuse problem in the background as well. They'd have like a highly decorated service record, like, you know, best arrest record on the force, but at the same time will have been disciplined multiple times for excessive use of force. Um, you a know. year away from retirement. Yeah, <laughs> e- exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, would have become like captain if it weren't for their, you know, excessive use of violence and things like this. <laughs> so they they all became kind of the same thing. But it, I, I love those stories. I think they, they kind of work. I mean, again, they, these these cops kind of become Superman themselves, like Dave was saying, you know, an 80s cop action film will end with the cop you know wading into some warehouse at the end and mm. armed up and probably shooting 20 blokes stone dead um and then you know getting to the main villain and he certainly won't be bringing him in alive to be arrested you know yeah. <laughs> he'll be going in in a, in a body bag 
Yeah. And, and you just think those kind of films wouldn't stand up now. I mean, God, especially in the current, mm. like you said, how the, the, the police force, especially in America, is perceived right now for, you know, for, for obvious reasons. I mean, that kind of story probably wouldn't fly now. You couldn't tell a cop oriented action film american action film at least and have that kind of stuff going on it just wouldn't fly but back then i think it just suited it suited the time i mean you know, yeah so many of the i think practically every major 80s action star would have done a cop film yeah i'm not sure if arnie ever did a cop film unless you count red heat i suppose he was a he was a russian cop, that, that wasn't cop. yeah <laughs> and cop, yeah, that that hard hitting uh, action brutal blockbuster. Um, the opening of that film, I will say that the opening of that yeah. film when he pulls up and he's looking like you know he's got the beard and he's sort of got those round glasses on yeah. and he talks about the car and it, the guy's about to do his car. He's like, you know, I love my car very very much. If anything, <laughs> he pulls out the shotgun and there was like, like, man, I'm just gonna look after it. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. But they all they all did them. I mean, and and quite often these cops would have like a military background as well. You know, maybe the cop served in Nam and you know came back to America and joined the force or something like that. You know, they always quite often had a military service record as well. So I think they became much of a muchness. But I think yeah. the good ones do stand the test of time, don't they? They do. And the thing is, what's interesting is I was watching a few. Um, you know, I've been watching a few. But I watched. I pulled out a couple I really liked. I watched Lethal Weapon. Yeah. Which nice. you know you, you've you've sort of like caught on there like that that hits although it's amazing and it sort of sets off a franchise like is is it hits every cliche like you've just said there sort of like cop with, you know on the edge with uh you know with military service in the background <laughs> lost his wife then the other one sort of you know one you know I'm too old for this shit and just about to retire <laughs> it's, it's got it it was he like, like forty when he when he yeah, entered that yeah. role <laughs> Well, it is. Like, yeah, literally, sort of like five years or no, six years later, he did Predator Two, and he takes yeah. on the Predator like you know, the same level as Arnie. Love Danny Glover. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's that sort of you know, it's, if you were playing sort of like action movie bingo, it's it's all there in Lethal Weapon. Like they they again, it's another one of those films. But one of the things I noticed as well, the other one I watched was um, I watched Beverly Hills Cop Two. And I love the Beverly Hills Cop films. I think yeah, Eddie Murphy was fantastic in that sort of, you know, he, again, another one where he's sort of like lightning in a bottle with a lot of that. But there's something I realised, and I was watching that, and I watched a couple of the Dirty Harry films as well, because I actually really like the Dirty Harry films. Um, there's a, there's a sort of a sly humour to them that I think Clint Eastwood has that, you know, sort of like you sometimes can, can slightly be glossed over. But I was watching them, and I realised, and it was sort of like, they are a concoction of things. The, the the eighties action cop films. They're an act, they're a combination of well we can't do westerns anymore because no bugger will watch them, but we can't and we can't do uh, like fifties and those noir films that we used to do. So we're going to take those Philip Marlowe characters and we're going to take the John Wayne characters and we're going to stick them all as police in Los Angeles or police <laughs> in New York, yeah. and then we're going to let them loose. And that's really all they are. They're just an extension with bigger guns. Um, of those films of noir films of like you know the um the big sleep or you know you sort of those dashiell hammett detective stories or a western you know there's one i didn't really know about and i still haven't watched it there's a film called coogan's bluff which i have i am now determined to prove is the start of all this and it's this transition from western to cop and it's about it's, it's clint eastwood and he plays a nevada or texas like cowboy marshal and he has to go to new york to to bring in a prisoner and then ends up having to sort of like you know find those city ways to sort of figure out how it all works and stuff and i'm like that's the transition point it's clearly there um but i couldn't get past it but the other thing that you, you said about like today you know about the, the the perception of the police in america especially at the moment um um what's it um brooklyn 99 is having to is being cancelled mm. they do as a, as a fun, because of it because they didn't feel comfortable presenting a comedy cop show and so even that has been impacted but i was watching beverly hills cop 2 and the judge reinhold character in that so throughout it they do these little bits and pieces and at the end of it like he pulls open his bond the boot of the police car and he pulls out a trench coat and all these fucking guns and he, <laughs> and, and axel Foley's like he's like you know when this is over we've we've got to have a talk 
And there's a part of me that's going like, no, no, no. A psychiatrist needs to be having a talk with this guy <laughs> because he's basically been waiting for this shootout. And if he hadn't have got it, like, what would have happened? Like, it's it's really sort of like it's funny. It's played for laughs in the film. But again, like you see it now, and you're like, yeah, there's a slightly uncomfortable undertone to this that I'm like, it hasn't aged well. Um, I think. <sighs> The one I, I love eighties action movies. Um, mm. The one thing that does leave me uncomfortable. You mentioned about Eddie Murphy, absolutely brilliant. You know, Forty Eight Hours, Beverly Hills Cop Two, uh, or Beverly Hills Cop rather. The the whole franchise loved him in Trading Places. Mm. But if I look back at the eighties. It is just so lacking in representation, isn't it? And I know I don't want to look back with a modern lens and go, oh, things were not right in the past. But it does make me uncomfortable that it's all a bit white saviour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't think I, I want to raise it because that's what it is. I don't want to look back and think, oh, that was brilliant. That was the golden time, wasn't it? That you know everything was perfect back then, and everything's just got worse since. No, it hasn't. It, it is this bubble, and we can look back and we can say these are the reasons that we love that era. You know, and I'm a I'm a middle aged white bloke, so yeah. it does represent me. But if I step out of my box, I think, well, yeah, it's fucking very severely lacking in representation, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? So. That, that uh, well, is the one fly in the ointment that, that yeah. does make me uncomfortable. When I was I say, it, 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 it's lacking in representation on the hero side. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not, not on the villain side. Not, the villains not, yeah. are very diverse. The villains are incredibly diverse. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, yeah, we were at the, the yeah, you're right. But the irony being, of course, when you get to the nub of it, that the two biggest action stars um of the 80s you know from american perspective is uh, a first generation austrian american immigrant and i think a third generation italian american immigrant so you know it, it, they they almost like and especially arnie the, the, they sort of perceive well they personify this idea of the american dream as well don't they it's that sort of thing if you can come to this country and make your fortune and you know, that was the other big thing of um you know because i mean arnie was a republican you know he became the governor and he was um, friends with uh, the Bush family as well later on, so he was he was shown to be that this ideal this ideal, um, and so you know was given this sort of push and and mm. um, it, it's no so that that sort of no sort of surprise really. But you're right about the the, the, the diversity in in eighties uh, um, action films on the hero side. Um, it, it, it's 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 false though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The whole idea that you can. Uh, the American dream, the fact that you can build yourself up from nothing. You you look at Arnie as an example. He is one in a billion. Yeah. And generally, there is a there is a more of a class divide there. You look at someone like the Trump kind of organization, if you like. You know, to run for president, you have to be minted from the start. Yeah. There's, there's no building yourself up. There's no working hard and building up towards, you know, being a good person or whatever. <laughs> it, it is so fucking corrupt. And again, this is just something I, I'm coming to realise later in life now. No, it's, it's true. The American dream is a complete fallacy. I mean, you know, like say, I've been saving my pennies to become president. Mm. Uh, no different to this. It's no real different to this country then, in, in all honesty. Um, yeah. But, you know, we're coming up to the hour, so we'll probably we'll round this out in a minute. But uh, there is there was two things I wanted to quickly point out, and there was a question I, I wanted to ask about a specific film. Um, really, well, there was two films I wanted to mention. The first is we talked about Arnie being a cop uh, and that sort of thing, and there's a there's a film that I think is much maligned and gets shit on, and I think is well it's seriously under, undeserved, and I think is aged incredibly well. Is Last Action Hero? Yeah. Um, You're pushing an open door here. Yeah. It is the probably it, it just came before uh it, it was too early yeah people weren't ready for it that has aged brilliantly because it's proper wink at the camera tongue mm-hmm. in cheek and people weren't ready for that 
people were still wanting to see the old Arnie. Yeah. And I think of all the movies that I've gone back and I've watched and I've gone, oof, that, that has not aged well. This isn't one of them. This is the flip side of that. Yeah. Last Action Hero has got to be one of my favorites where I've looked back and I've gone, actually, you know what? That, that got slated at the time, but it was completely not justified. That is a great, great movie. Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts on uh, Last Action Hero? Absolutely love it. It's so ahead of its time. Yeah. That way it just lampoons all the cop movie uh, tropes and cliches <laughs> and pokes fun at them. It's so well-known. And it's so meta as well to, mm. you know, to have you know this fictional character brought into the real world and then actually interact with the actual Arnold Schwarzenegger as well yeah. at one point. Um and it's just so cleverly done. I mean, yeah. like you said, it would, uh, like Dave said, I think people weren't ready. And I think if it was released maybe in the last 10 or 15 years, it would have done a lot better than it did. I think people's, especially action, maybe back then, action fans' sort of tastes and desires perhaps weren't as sophisticated as perhaps they've evolved to be over the 90s and the noughties and what. People still wanted, you know, just kiss, kiss, bang, bang, kill the bandits mm. and all the rest of it but i think it's just a really clever piece of work and and mm. it you know it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination and and i think when people talk about the schwarzenegger canon and all the favorites it doesn't go to the top of the tree with your terminators and your predators and your commandos and your your raw deals and all the rest of it but it's a really really well done film and and i i really like it yeah for sure yeah no, I agree. I think mean, it's amazing. It's again, it's one of those I've watched relatively recently, and I was like, "Yeah, this has aged incredibly well." The bit where they go to the police station, and it's just like, like joke after joke after joke. Like you know, some of them land better than others, but like the fact that like Robert Patrick dressed as the T one thousand walked past him, yeah. and you know, and then he interacts with like a cartoon, like cartoon cat. Um, a detective and all this other stuff like it knows exactly what it is and it's hilarious but I think the fact of the matter is and it came in 93 didn't it Yeah. in 1993 people wanted a Jack Slater movie they didn't want Last Action Hero they wanted an actual Jack Slater movie that's what they were expecting and when they go and see it and it's taking like I say making fun of the films that they love I think people sort of like you know um, a little bit railed against it but you're right. I think if that had been released in the last ten years, um, especially during this sort of like you know this Marvel, especially like maybe even pre Deadpool, like because it's it's got that fourth wall breaking mm. kind of thing. Like, um, I think it would have done a lot, lot better. I don't know who'd have been in it, but it definitely. Had, I'd have like if anything, if it had done it now, say it was in the last ten years. Obviously, Arnie couldn't have played Jack Slater. You'd have had someone playing it, but I've had him as the captain. You know, yeah. you'd have had a, you'd have had Arnie as a cameo or something in that way. It's got, but... it's got to be the Rock, isn't it? Surely. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's the modern day Schwarzenegger. Yeah. There you yeah. go. The Rock is, is, yeah. Okay. Right. We have talked for an hour now about um, 80s action. We've talked everything. We've covered some amazing points. I didn't even think you know we were going to cover, but we we sort of stuck to films. We've talked politics. We've talked military perception. It's been awesome. Um, last thing I'm going to do then, all right, and I'm going to put you both on the spot now. And uh, so I'm going to think, all I want you to name, all right, and it's not, it's not going to be your favourite, all right, but one, what I want you to name is, someone comes to you and says, what three 80s action movies should I watch? What do you tell them? There you go. Okay, you're both blind. Boy. <laughs> three. You got three. And I'm going to start by putting you on the spot. And I'm looking, I'm choosing, I'm choosing. I'm going to go... Well, you were just talking to me. Go to him. Dave. You're going to go first. So, what? What are your thoughts, Dave? You've got. You know, someone's come to you and said, "Oh, well, you've talked about these, but what three '80s action films should I go and watch?" I think you know what we we've been speaking for so long, and I feel like we've we've only just scratched the surface. I know. And you know, because we've talked a lot about Arnie and Stallone. You know, we haven't talked about Swayze, not talked about... Um, I, I mean, you've got a fair few... You've got a couple of Star Wars movies in there. Mm. Um, I, we've not talked about Van Damme. We haven't talked um, about Bruce... We haven't talked about Die Hard. Bruce Willis, obviously, coming later in the 80s. He was Joe Everyman, of course. We've yeah. not talked about... What about the sci-fi part of the action genre? You know, so Robocop, 
Aliens. I mean, we spoke about Predator, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm procrastinating enough. One of your favorites, <laughs> um, uh, you know, Indiana Jones. Yeah. Those movies, you know, you would put those in action as well. <sighs> if I was to name three movies, though, that encapsulates the 80s, I think as much as I love Commando, and we talked about that mm. before, I'm going to try and cover, in my mind, I'm imagining you know action as being this big old venn diagram so i've got lots of different circles and so i've got a bit of sci-fi in there big load of action i think with predator we get you know a bit of rocky four obviously that Mm -hmm. was the whole genesis of the idea um you've got some sci-fi in there as well as well as you know this bigger than life hero so predator i think has to be in there uh whoa. what else was i thinking sword and sorcery now i can't have another arnie one um <laughs> uh, hold on I, I did have something in mind. you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna flip to the other side one of my favorites is one that we've covered recently on the on the vhs strikes back and it is van damme's first movie and i heard you speak about it to the um guy you were talking to canon was it yeah, alex yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and he was saying basically van damme was pestering him and he had these producers who were sat- wanting to push this script for blood sport mm-hmm. and he was like oh fuck it go and make it and stop pissing me off <laughs> blood sport for me i just love it it is so fantastic, and I love all the different styles of martial arts there. you got Bolo, you know, yes. classic kind of martial arts villain. So I think I'm going to put Bloodsport in there as well. Because I've got a military thing in there, you know, we haven't touched on things like Full Metal Jacket, Platoon. Those, again, were very much more serious kind of, mm. this is the real kind of thing with war. But I'm going to go for a buddy cop movie i'm gonna go for lethal weapon as well so i think in those in my mind those quadrants the only thing i've not covered there is like sword and sorcery i've missed out things like crawl um obviously conan but yeah i I think i've got a good spread there no that's good i like that so predator um blood sport and lethal Lethal weapon weapon. Yep. It's, a, it's, a, it's a good trinity. I like that. Okay. So, Max, same question to you. Someone's come, what should they watch to, to represent 80s action movies? Okay. My three, in no particular order, first one I have to go is Die Hard, the first Die Hard movie. Yeah. Because it's such an influential movie. How many times, even today, do we get films and people refer to it as Die Hard on a, and then insert yeah. a, a location? Well, that, 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 that was, that was basically... Play. I was going to say, that was basically 1990 to 1997, sort of, yeah. every film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and and I think Dave alluded to it before as well. You had Willis coming along, who mm. wasn't the He-Man figure that Arnie and Sly and Van Damme and Lundgren were. I mean, you know, he was in great shape, especially in those days. But he, he looked and felt like a normal man. You could identify with him more. And he abs- and, and during the course of that film, he absolutely takes a pounding as well. Mm-hmm. You know, you couldn't imagine... If they'd have made that film and cast Sly or Arnie, especially back then in 88, it wouldn't have been anything like that. They, they would have gone through that film with not so much as a scratch or a flesh wound. Whereas Willis gets absolutely... He gets the shit kicked out of him from, you know, for 90 minutes to hour, two hours, however long it is. So I have to go with Die Hard because its influence mm. is, is so far reaching. But it's still um, being felt now. Still being felt now, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. 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 My second one, um, an unusual selection, but I'm going to go with Steven Seagal's debut feature, Above the Law, also known <laughs> yeah. as Nick, Nico in some territory, <laughs> yeah. for those uh, who uh, know it as Nico. And Now, people like to mock Seagal because of the kind of person he's sort of evolved into over the years he's a bit of a figure of fun and rightly so to be fair let's face it but i will put seagal's first five movies up against any other action stars first five movies and i think they hold up above the law um hard to kill out for justice mark for death and culminating with under siege which is like his crowning glory mm-hmm. and all went tits up after that 
But die, those, hard, those, die hard on a warship. Die yeah. hard on a warship, there you go. <laughs> but those first five were great. And that first one specifically, Above the Law, because he just presented a kind of different kind of action style at the time. I know that, you know, there'd been other martial arts guys in the 80s, Chuck Norris and, and mm. Van Damme as well was obviously around coming up at that time as well, late 80s. But Seagal just presented a different kind of hero, a kind of understated, quite cool kind of guy. I mean, again, people, I think people look at Seagal through the prism of what he is and who he is now and the crap films he's made over the last 10 or 15 years the, and, and just how shit he is. But back then, he was, I'll, I'll die on this hill, he was fucking badass. And I will take that to my grave. I absolutely love Seagal's first five films. So, so I have to put Above the Law in there. And then my third and final one, it's got to be an Arnie or a Sly if you're talking 80s action. So I know Dave's already had it, but I have to have it too because it's my favourite of Arnie's films. I think it's him at his absolute apex of his career. And that's Predator. I yeah. just think it's the perfect perfect film it holds up now you don't watch it and go oh that's you know those special effects look a bit rubbish or you know this is some 80s crap it's a great film and yeah. you know it, it looks like we said before it goes from start to finish it doesn't stop there's no you know there's no contemplation in it it's just, you know you just drop six badasses in a jungle and all hell breaks loose it is a perfect film and it looks a million dollars it, you know, the performances are really good in it. The characters are larger than life. It loses points for the Heidi High end credits. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it does not. All of that. <laughs> all of that. All of that. All of that. In the most horrific style, mutilated deaths, all the rest of it, and now winking for the camera going, you're right. So that's, that's such all, a weird that's choice. Weird. And Carl Weathers is my favourite one out of all of them. <laughs> yeah. Sort of oh, for me, it's Billy. At the camera, yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, these men you've just seen slaughtered in horrific ways are now sort of winking for the camera. But maybe all films should end like that. I'd like to see it, you know. Um, yeah, so those are my three. Predator, Die Hard, and Above the Law. What, would, what would your thing. three be, Scott? I'd love to know. Well, the thing, funny enough, because, yeah, I thought this. So I, um, I was trying to see, could I do different ones? Could I jump, you know, could, so if I was going to choose an Arnie film. But the, the problem is, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Max Predator is possibly one of the one of those perfect films. Now that's not saying that everyone has to like it, but it just it knows what it wants to be, it knows what it's going to do, and it does it. Um, you know, it's sort of like the pacing is spot on, the casting is awesome. You know, it's just a bunch of like like huge blokes in the jungle <laughs> versus the Predator, and I'm so glad they changed the Predator as well. Like Stan Winston saved the day because originally obviously it was Van Damme in a rubber suit that looks like a duck. Um, it's terrible. It's awful. <laughs> um, but like I said, that film when they attack the encampment, and you're like, you know, that we are going to show you how badass these guys are going to be, and how awesome they are. You know, sort of like you know, you hit, you're bleeding, men, I ain't got time to bleed. Just awesome <laughs> oh, one liners. So that film is so good. So Predator is, was was always on my list, and it's one of my go to films. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Um. So I'm going to try to do. So I want to do something different uh, of how it represents, but it's so difficult because there's just this top tier of action films in in the uh, in the eighties that when you say this is what eighties action is, so Predator's up there because it's got the bombast, it's got the sort of the muscle bound character. However, I am going to throw in. Um, I am going to throw in a Rambo film, um, and I, I am going to do it for for reasons. I'm going to throw in Rambo three. Um, we didn't really touch on it much, but because it's so ludicrous, um, it's one of it's it's sort of the it's the apex of like Rambo reaching that ludicrousness. Like, and for some reason, I, I just really like that. I've, I've got to have a Stallone film in there. Like the bit where he's like he's driving a tank at the end against a helicopter, and they're surrounded by you know him and um, Colonel what's it um, Troutman are Troutman. caught in that trench, and the the Russians are all coming, and he's like you know Johnny, what are we gonna do? And he's like just like clocks his gun, he's like, fuck him, and then like, runs out. <laughs> it's amazing. It's so ridiculous, but I love that film to bits. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm having Rambo 3 just because it's ludicrousness. But I also want to throw in, I thought about this, and I'm going to be taking one of yours, Dave. It's got to be um, Lethal Weapon because, again, it's that sort of idea of the buddy cop film. It's all... Mm. It hits everything on the bingo sheet of, like, you know, it's the, the pacing's good, the cast are good. 
it's got all those bits and pieces in it and it sort of hits all those neat those bits but it's just fantastic film so that that would be the three where it'd be like go and see these because they are the ones that are going to show you sort of like what the 80s was all about like th- th- these are the films that were produced by snorting a huge amount of cocaine and just <laughs> go off and do whatever they want um but yeah no i think that's 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 sort of it there are more i mean you're right like it's difficult because again i love robocop you know i love um you know all these other films that just sort of like you know you can't get away from i only had some you know some duffers i mean i'm I'm not a fan of raw deal um but i also but then you also get like i love um the running man which i think is ace you know it's great satire um but yeah but that's the 80s i think we have you're right they did very really scratched the surface on this and i think we might have to come back on this one and because you're right we haven't talked about die hard properly and we haven't talked about the transition into the 90s. So I wouldn't mind. I think we'll come back and we'll do a 90s. Um, what about the 90s? You know, now that's what I call 90s action. I'm going to call this one. This, this episode, now, we call, now that's what I call 80s. I like now, it. Now that's what I call 80s action. Um, and so I think we're going to come back and we're going to do, now that's what I call 90s. Um, and we could go all the way through. But I'm 20th century geek, but I can do whatever the fuck I want. It's my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I'd love to, and again, because the reason I start, I wanted to do this as well, because I went to see the Fast and the Furious 9 the other day, nice. and I grinned ear to ear in that film, because <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. I laughed out loud at some of the stunts and stuff that were going on, um, but it's tremendous fun, and I think that's the point of action films. It's like, especially modern action films, they're not supposed to make a great deal of sense, but if you are having fun watching the stunts and all the stuff that's going on, then, you know, it's about the bombast. It's about the wow. It's about the spectacle. And it started in the 80s with Arnie's biceps, basically. So, uh, yeah. But if, got, if you'd be interested, guys, would you be coming back for now? That's what I call 90s action. Uh, hell yes. 100%. Yeah. Okay. In fact, not... I'm just going to give you a big Arnie predator handshake <laughs> here. <laughs> What's with all this fucking tie business, man? Um, the CIA's got push, you pushing too many pencils. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we didn't do enough Arnley impressions in this one. We got next in the no. next one. We'll, next one we'll, we'll do some Van Damme. We got Batman and Robin, haven't we? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we'll see what we think about that one. Anyway, right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. But before you go, let's just chip in. So, Dave, where can people find you, and where can people listen to you? Where can't you find me? So um, you can get me on Comics in Motion TV and Movie Reviews on a Friday. You can get me on the VHS Strikes Back, which, as the name suggests, we go back and look at all those videos in uh, that golden era of uh, home video. You can also get me on uh, the Back to the Office podcast, where we're going back to the original UK office with Ricky Gervais, and that is so much fun, I have to say. Excellent. Yeah, all well worth listening to. Um, the dream is one day you've got to get Ricky Gervais on that podcast or uh, one of those. Um, <laughs> the only one I've ever listened to is uh, you know, your, your reality TV show ones. I, I, I tend I, to I, omit that one because yeah. like, I, I know people aren't <laughs> going to be asked about it. Like, I was getting a whole load of abuse last night because there was some great football on and everyone was like, fucking who the fuck would be watching Love Island at this time? <laughs> and I'm like... Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Fantastic. Max, what about you? Where can people find you and where can people listen to you? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Maxi Byrne, which is spelled M A X Y B Y R N E. If you go there, there's links to the different websites I write sort of articles and reviews for because of comic book related nonsense. Um, and then my show is on the Comics in Motion Network feed, Mandatory Marvel and DC. Uh, check it out if you subscribe to the feed you'll get that show along with about a million other brilliant shows as well um so by all means check it out and say hello excellent brilliant well thank you very much guys for coming on and ladies and gentlemen if you want to come and contact us or speak to me about any of the action uh, any action movie past present future whatever you want to talk about or any of the stuff we've talked about on the podcast you can find me on twitter at 20th century geek and all the other social medias just look for 20th century geek on pretty much everywhere all over the place or you can email us as 20th century geek at gmail.com and if you like the show if you really like what we're doing and what we're talking about go and give us a five-star review on the over podcast catcher of choice and more than that if you 
really like what you're doing and you want to help me keep the lights on in 20th Century Towers, go on to Patreon. That's patreon.com slash 20CG media that's 20th century geek media now we're doing we have a patreon and we've got multiple tiers on there and we do all kinds of bits and pieces i've got weekly podcasts i've got uh, other podcasts that i'm doing with julian to look at the uh, twilight zone uh, and a whole load of other stuff so go on and check it out other than that thank you very much for listening guys it's been an absolute pleasure this one uh, and we will be back oh see <laughs> i'll be back that that was completely <laughs> unfun. <laughs> but on that bombshell thank you very much guys Sequart presents Judging Dread, 13 essays, analyzing 2000 AD's most beloved and reviled character, forward by Matt Smith, interview with Rob Williams, edited by Scott Weatherly. Find out who is the law. Book available to purchase from Sequart, Amazon.com.uk and all other great book sellers. Mm-hmm.